the lights off. Yeah, let's turn them back off. Oh, where'd all these lights go? There he is. All right. Hey, time of worship and song is meant to prepare us for listening to God's word. So let's let's pay attention. Um, last week we talked about, or we started talking about the Beatitudes. We're talking uh, about what Jesus said uh, in our Cross Life Creed. The, the Make Disciples part of that it includes uh, teaching by word and by example all that Christ has taught. So we are going through teachings of Jesus. Ooh, that's nice. We're going through teachings of Jesus, and we're starting with the Sermon on the Mount. And last week we started going through the Beatitudes. Now, uh, there's a lot in these, these pa- this small passage on the Beatitudes, so uh, I wasn't able to finish it, and we're not going to finish it tonight. We're going to just take one part of it. Um, but before we go any farther, let's put away our phones. Um, and if you have a Bible, let's grab our Bibles. Um, Unless you're looking at the Bible on your phone. It's very obvious if you're not reading your Bible on your phone when other people are looking over your shoulder (laughs) and laughing. So, anyway. Tonight we're going to go into the next beatitude. These first three that we talked about last week, uh, before we talk about it, when we talked last week, go ahead to the next slide, Alex, so we can see those first verses. We talked about how this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. This is Discipleship 101. This is uh, him teaching his followers what it looks like to be a follower. And so he starts his sermon here with a description, not a prescription as we talked about, a description of what a Christian will look like. It's not a prescription as in, hey, if you do these things, it'll make you a follower of Christ but it's a description of what it is to follow Christ. You are a follower of Jesus. This is what you will look like. And so last week, we talked about those first three characteristics. We talked about uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. We talked about how that was a a right view of ourselves that we're sinners. That's what we are. We sin against God. We don't obey God's law. That, that's the way it is. And the most honest and truthful thing I can tell a person is that they are a sinner. The, the most loving thing I can do is tell somebody they're a sinner. The most loving thing I can do for myself is to remind myself that I'm a sinner and that I need God. And that apart from Him, I'm lost. And so I recognize in my weakness in my sinfulness that I am nothing in comparison but what it says here is that it's a blessed thing to be at that point when you are humbled before God you understand who you are in his eyes apart from him that's where you start it says theirs is the kingdom of heaven a blessed blessed thing a happy thing to be poor in spirit doesn't make sense in the world's view those that don't know Christ as their personal Lord and Savior this doesn't make any sense I'm supposed to have good self-worth. I'm supposed to feel good about myself. That's just not the case. And to be honest, it never leads to anything. It just leads to more selfishness. You're never going to be satisfied with uh, how much of yourself you get. I can promise you that. But what, but what I can also promise you is when you empty yourself and you recognize that you are poor in spirit, that you're a sinner, that you mo- when you mourn over that sin and it, and it causes you to weep because you understand the wretchedness, you're humbled by it as well, and you're in a good position as a Christian. It, it's a good place to be. This is exactly what we need. In, in fact, what I, I titled the, the going up the mountain side of these Beatitudes is the awareness of our need and those things and and being poor in spirit in our mourning in our meekness we recognize that we have a desperate need for something 
if we're poor in spirit because we know that we're a sinner, we know that we do things wrong, if we're sorry about it, we're mourning over it, we, we don't like it, and it humbles us to the point where we realize that I, it's not about me because I'm not, I'm, I'm not good enough. What that brings us to is the point of need. We know we need something to, to fill us, to bring us to completion. We need something that's going to uh, fix the problem that we have, to answer the need that we have. And praise God, as we look at these Beatitudes, as we're working our way towards this, tonight what we get is the satisfaction of the need. We, we, get, the fulfi- we get to see... <laughs> we, we get the satisfaction here. It says, So far, poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This is what we get for being these things in Christ Jesus. This is who we are. This is something we should we should continue to, to cultivate in our lives. But when we see these things, we also recognize that we need something. And this very next beatitude, go ahead, Alex, to the next slide, what we're going to talk about tonight. It says, blessed or blessed, however you want to say it, are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. See, this is the central component of the Beatitudes. This is the pinnacle of our mountain over here. And again, this is not natural. None of these things are natural. None of these attitudes are natural. None of these things come to us just by being human. These come only by the regeneration and transformation of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Bringing about these things, seeing us become poor in spirit and mourning and hungering and thirst or, or, and, and being meek and hungering and thirsting because we know we need something, God brings the satisfaction. So let's look at this for a second. It says blessed, we've already talked about blessed, this is about happy, joyful, someone who should be envied for what they have are those who hunger and thirst. For righteousness. Now the first word we need to look at is is righteousness because it's not just blessed are those who are hungry and thirsty. This isn't just for those who really wanted a taco. This isn't for those who really needed a drink of water because they had six stale crackers. (laughs) Sorry for that, by the way. I didn't know they were stale until I opened them. My bad. Yeah, they were probably really old. Anyway, that's not the point. It was cruel and unusual punishment. But it's not that kind of hungering and thirsting. It's hungering and thirsting for righteousness. We know that we're not right. We're poor in spirit. We mourn over our sin. We, we are meek and humbled by it. There's something not right. So we're hungering and thirsting for some kind of rightness. Righteousness. Goodness. Something else. Ness. I'm just going to add Ness because I was already on a roll there. It's, it's seeking something that's going to make things right. We know what that is. We, we know what the answer is. It's Jesus. Oh, uh, that's Sunday school answer. That's the perfect answer to this. It's Jesus. He's the one that satisfies this need. How? Two ways. One... By dying on the cross for our sins, being buried and rose again the third day to justify us, we that believe in Him are completely justified. We are completely saved. We are completely holy in an eternal view. He no longer counts our sin against us. He makes right what was wrong through Jesus. Not because of me. And not even because I deserved it. I didn't deserve it. What I deserve is hell. What I deserve 
is being lost in my lostness. Is to be separated from God for all eternity. That's what I deserve. But what He gave is everything. What He gave is His righteousness. He took my dirty rags and placed His righteousness on me. So when God sees me now, He sees Jesus. And that's in an internal uh, perspective. That... Because obviously we know that there's a second part of this. We're not right right now. I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian at least since 16. And I, there's things in my life that are not righteous. I'm still a sinner. I'm still trapped in this flesh. Paul in Romans 7 continually tells us uh, that the things he wants to do, he can't do. And the things he doesn't want to do is what he keeps on doing and he finds himself doing them over and over again and he calls out and he cries out, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Jesus. He triumphantly says, Jesus does. That's who. When I die here on this earth, If I have placed my faith in Christ, I will spend eternity with Him because I am right. My account is made right in God's God's view, in God's journal of accounting. I'm free, debt free. I owe nothing. He paid it all. And not only paid my debt, He gave me His righteousness. So there's that's the first way to think about this hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Righteousness is something that we are given. Okay? But there's a second part of this that even now, I'm not right. So in my still beating heart, living here on this earth, I continue to hunger and thirst for rightness. To to stop sinning. To, to please God with my life. Do I do it perfectly every day? Absolutely not. But the desire of my heart is to be right. To take what God's Word says and when He, when he tells me this is what it needs to be like, I want it. I want to be right. I want to be holy. I want to be like Jesus. I hunger for it. I thirst for it. Now, this isn't, like I said, this isn't just a, a hungering in for a taco and thirsty like you just ate six crackers. This is, a, this is, I'm a starving for it. I'm running through the desert, and it's 120 degrees, and I have no water. I am thirsty. I haven't eaten for two weeks. I need something to eat. I am starving. seeking for an oasis. It's seeking for a morsel of bread. It's seeking after something because you know that in your weakness, in your sinfulness, in your brokenness, you are desperately hungry. You are desperately thirsty. You have got to get something or you will die. Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness like that? So it's a very deep hunger and thirst, but it's also an ongoing hunger and thirst. The more I grow as a Christian, and believe me when I say I, I'm no, I, I may be a little farther ahead than some in some regards, but that doesn't make me any higher in God's viewpoint. But what I can say is the more that I grow in Christ and the more things that I'm trying to get right and, and seek to change, the more I recognize there's a lot more. There's a lot more to change. There's a lot more that's wrong with me in my sinful flesh that needs to change and I'm continually hungry and I'm continually thirsty for righteousness. I want to be right in His eyes. I want to please Him. I want to do what glorifies Him and honors Him. I want to do what He says because He's my Father and He has saved me and He has given me all that I have ever desired and spiritual blessings that can't be seen. So it's a blessed thing to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Why? 
because there's satisfaction for it. God promises two things. If we got two things that we're dealing with, a righteousness that is eternal and a righteousness that is temporal right now that we are working towards being more like Christ every day, there's two satisfactions then as well. One is, of course, the gospel brings us to understand that there's satisfaction in that first one. We're holy in Him. In Christ, I am completely loved. I am completely holy. I am completely without sin. I am debt-free. But that second one, you will continue hungering and thirsting, yes. You'll continue growing, yes. But you will find satisfaction along the way. As I said, I, I do change. I do grow. And I, I, I become more like Christ. It, it, and so I get, I'm satisfied at those moments and I recognize, man, God, you brought me a long way. So there's moments of satisfaction where he brings that around. He's, he wants us to change. He wants us to be right. He wouldn't give us all of this just to say, hey, go figure it out on your own and do your own thing. He, he gave us all of this to say, okay, here's what I did for you. Now, now here, here's what I want you to go do. And, and it falls into those three things that we talked about with the creed, loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength in every area, whether it's our health, whether it's our finances, whether it's uh, our, our feelings, whether it's our relationships, whether it's uh, our, our spiritual health, whatever area of life, with all our heart, we should love God. And, and then we should love other people. That well, He talks a lot about how we're supposed to love other people. We're talking about anger and, and relationships and husbands and wives and children and, and even employer, employee. Everything that He wants us to be is right here. And so we can find satisfaction when we hear God's word we see the righteousness that we should have and we go after it. we find victory in certain areas we find uh, that we overcome and change old habits to become new habits that honor God I'm no longer a liar remember we talked about that when is a liar no longer a liar when he's a truth teller not when he stops lying. He's just if he stops lying, he's just a liar on vacation. He become when some, when a liar is no longer a liar is when he becomes someone who you can who you can count on to tell the truth. When we begin to change in those areas, that we find satisfaction. It's so much more satisfying to live as a truth teller than as a liar. It's so much more satisfying to live as someone who gives than to constantly steal. There's so much more satisfaction in knowing that you are right before God in your daily living than there, there ever could be in just going through the motions. There is satisfaction to be had. He doesn't, he doesn't say there might be. So it's a promise. They shall be satisfied. Go after hunger and thirst for righteousness in your life. If you're for the first time and you've never believed, Hunger and thirst for that. You've got to recognize your need. You've got to understand you're poor in spirit, that you, that you are a sinner. There's got to be some mourning about it. You've got to recognize you have a need. And it should humble you, bring you to your knees, to hunger and thirst for the righteousness that only Christ provides through the gospel and what He's done for us. And for those who are Christians in this room, we continue to pursue righteousness. Don't, don't just be satisfied with, okay, there is no okay. We've talked about this many times. There's no gray areas with God. There's either for Him or against Him in any area of your life. You're either for Him or against Him in the way you talk to your family. You're either for Him or against Him in the way you do your work at school. You're either for Him or against Him in the way you talk to people and what you think about and what you watch and what you listen to. You're either for Him or against Him. You're not, there's not just an okay. It's very much black and white. There's no gray area. The only satisfaction that comes is living in the light, satisfied by God, not being satisfied with other things that do not, do not honor Him. But you will be satisfied. That's the promise. A lot here just in this one beatitude. But like I said, this is the pinnacle point. This is the, the apex 
This is where it all comes together for us. You're saved. You've been satisfied by the righteousness that Christ provides. Or you are being saved even now as you grow in Christ and become more like Him and honor God with your life. So where are you? Look at your life. Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? Can you go another day without being righteous? Can you go another day without searching and seeking to be more right with God? Is that If that's possible, you must examine yourself. If that's possible, we've got to ask ourselves the question, do I really follow Christ? Because remember, this is a description of what a Christian will look like. If this goes against the grain of who you are, good. It needs to. Because you need to recognize that you have a need that only Christ can fulfill. I'm going to ask Jeremy to come up. And uh, Aaron and Rachel in the band. We're going to have a song, time of invitation. A chance for you to respond.